The following field report contains criticism of common systems used by publishers worldwide. This video is in no way directed against individuals or specific studios. The following self-experiment should be understood as a brief and incomplete report for indie game developers who have in mind teaming up with a publisher. As soon as you put a game you finished on any of the available stores for the world to discover, you might also start getting those, nah, let's say, not trustworthy looking emails from publishers and others who claim to be one. The main message out of those mails is that they would like to partner up with you, publish your game and make you, the developer, rich as f Anyway. Since I launched my game Country Ball Potato Miami on the Apple App Store and Google's Play Store, I got hundreds of those sometimes really scammy looking mails. Recently, out of curiosity, I decided to reply to one of them. So in this video I'm going to share my experience with talking to a mobile game publisher the first time ever, in the hope that it may help you with your projects. Hmm, okay, uh, then let's find a title for this video. How about unexperienced indie game developer? Uh, response to publisher spam mail and gets poof, yeah, what did I get? Well, let's go and find out. Hi, I'm a part-time indie developer and illustrator. I've gained my knowledge through thousands of online tutorials and now I want to give something back and share these skills with you. If you like these videos, subscribe to the channel to not miss new videos coming up and if you want to support me, check out my website that contains my published games and a detailed dev blog and much more or hit me up on Twitter. Hello and welcome dear friends. It's good to see you again, hope you're all doing well. Because this is a game dev related video, I have the pleasure to show you a new community spotlight at the end. The community spotlight is a short time slot where subscribers of the channel and Discord members, the link is down in the description, get a chance to be featured and show their personal work to the world. So hit that subscribe button, join the Discord and get a chance for your project to be featured in the next video. But now back to this video's topic. So as I mentioned, I got this email from a random dude that looked similar to this. Hi, nice to meet you. I'm, well, obviously I'm replacing the real name of the studio and the individuals here, but to be honest, most of those mails have the most generic Western names you can think of. So let's see which one we're gonna pick today. Hi, nice to meet you. I'm David. I work for, publisher name, we are leading the charts with, and here comes a list of all the games they make with over 99 trillion downloads. Uh, well, I'm exaggerating here, you get the point, um, but let's dig a bit deeper into the text. What you're seeing here is kind of a buildup of tension. The person or studio presents itself as extremely valuable and successful. Wow. And if you know one or more successful titles from their list, it's of course an attention jackpot for them and you'll most likely be very impressed. Now, the mail continues in most cases somehow like I came across your game, in my case Country Ball Potato Miami. I think it's amazing or even just very cool stuff. When you read your game's name in such a message you feel proud and happy. However, it's also clear that the title of your game is nothing more than a placeholder. Through all the people I got messaged online, I found out that they got the exact same mail, which means they use templates that you can fill in with anything. I came across an S-shaped tree, very cool stuff. This is great. Nothing wrong about that, right? No, but you'll see why I point this out a little bit later in this video. Let's continue. At the end, you'll usually find their Skype contact or another way to book an appointment with them, plus something like, if you're up for it, let's chat. This sentence may seem very harmless and likable, but in my opinion it also might be a psychological trick. Proposing to someone in such an explicit way the option of not doing what they want you to do increases the willingness of the person to actually do it. And here's why. Because that person feels like she or he is the decision maker. Feeling free and superior in one's choice increases one's confidence in the opposing party, here the publisher, and thus the chance of the desired action for them, so that you contact them back. So is it reprehensible to use such tactics to get someone to take an action, in this case replying to the mail? Absolutely not. It's a completely legitimate way of communicating to your advantage. But if you know about these little details, it's easier to not fall for it. 
Okay, so that was it. I received this email and I ignored it. Some days later, David wrote me again to check if I missed this last mail and if I would be interested in chatting. Again, I ignored it. Those kind of checking back mails are automatically sent to each address they have in their mailing list. But how did I even land on their mailing list? If you offer games online, you most likely have your support email up somewhere on the internet, so it's easy for potential collectors to find it. After I ignored David's second message, I received a third a few days later, again asking if it's possible to schedule a date for an interview. As David's studio is based in North America, he also offered to connect me to their European branch office so time zones wouldn't be an issue. I gave it a try and visited their website and found out that they really were one of the biggest players on the hyper-casual mobile market. Their website looked legit and they also had remarkable success with their games. Although most of those games look like they come straight out of clickbait hell. And I even knew many of them from in-game or web ads. If you want my opinion on those, best check out my game dev rap guys. <laughs> yeah, well, I promise you will regret it. After checking out their website, I was like, well, what do I have to lose? Maybe it's an opportunity. Maybe they are genuinely interested in my game. Maybe I can start being a full-time indie dev soon. By the way, if you are interested in what I do when I'm not sharing my experience with publishers, check out my devlog videos I upload on a regular basis, that would mean the world to me. I wrote David that I'd be interested in more information about cooperation opportunities and that I'd like to accept the invite. As they have an office in Germany, I'd prefer to talk to their team there. He kindly forwarded my mail to that dude in Germany, let's call him Adam. From all the available dates Adam sent me, I picked a 30 minute time slot already for the next day. The reason behind it was that I'd like to see if they had already played my game at that point or they just contact as many game devs they can without really looking at the games or even playing them. And here's why. There are publishers, especially on the mobile market, that are interested in publishing or even buying a huge number of games in the hope that one or two of them will become super successful while the unsuccessful rest will be dumped. If that's the case, it's surely less efficient for them to invest time on checking all of those games out first. Coming back to what I mentioned before, that's also why they use these fill-in templates to flood the inboxes of potential game devs. And from the available time slots in Adam's calendar, I guess he's having many, many interviews with potential partners per day. I found out that they publish at least five games per month. Imagine that's more than one title per week. Admittedly, I was already a bit biased. As you may already know from my other videos, I'm a lousy negotiator. That's why it's even more important to prepare well for the conversation, to be able to represent your own point of view and stand up for the game. Adam, the guy I was about to talk to, would most likely be a professional, trained to convince other people. Knowing that I had to learn at least the basics about publishing, I watched many videos available on YouTube about that topic. For you to start with, I recommend the following videos, which I'll all link down in the description. The creators share their experience and knowledge, which really helped me to prepare for this first encounter. The next day. It was about time for the chat, but Adam forgot about it. Nothing against him, such a thing is absolutely okay. It's not a brilliant start, but can happen to anyone, let's forget that, no bad blood. As part of the preparation, I also had a look at Adam's LinkedIn profile. And please don't get me wrong here, I'm aware that English is the language of game developers, and I adapt to it in my daily life, of course. However, since the studio has supposedly an office in a major German city, and I specifically asked to speak to someone who could explain the complex business guidelines to me in German, I was a bit disappointed that he couldn't help me out there, neither he could organize an assistant. I can't say anything bad about the start of the conversation with Adam. He was friendly, funny and also responsive to all my questions. I openly told him that this was my first time talking to a possible publishing partner and what my goals are in game dev in general. A pleasant conversation, but one that also gave me the feeling that Adam hadn't actually played my game. It seemed like he was flipping through the screenshots on the stores in parallel, asking about superficial details to make me feel like he had played it. 
When I asked why his studio had contacted me, he replied with, we keep our eyes open. When it came to the publishing process itself and legal things, however, Adam began to speak very quickly and in abbreviations. I lost him while he was double timing and thought to myself, don't agree or even say yes, as long as you don't understand what's going on. Adam finished and I asked him to explain me again the whole process a bit slower. And kind as he was, he did. I interrupted him every time I wasn't sure about what he said and it started to get a little bit uncomfortable. Uh. I tried to sum up the whole process that he explained me. Um, but again, English is not my first language and Adam rushed through this in light speed. But uh, from what I understood, this is the process. First, I'd be invited to a private chat. Second, I'd upload screenshots and explanations of my game to the chat. Third, they would make a prototype out of my game that already exists. Then they would send it to their peer group analytics professionals for testing the possible profit. Okay, then they would further elaborate that prototype and only if this prototype seems to be successful and profitable, we would make and agree on a contract that includes selling my IP. Okay, let's sync this in for a second. From what I understood, in simple words, they would basically copy my game, test if people would be interested in spending money for it. If yes, they would continue in cloning my already existent game and give me the chance to sign their contract, including giving away my intellectual property regarding that game. In addition, Adam guaranteed me $100,000 if we reach that point. Okay, and what if we don't reach that point or I don't sign that contract? Well, I think personally, I don't get paid and they have a clone of my game. Because I watched that video from Thomas Brush who advises never sell your IP. I confronted Adam with that statement and he literally questioned that casual games even have an IP. I quote from my memory. If you look at all those hyper-casual games, they don't even have an IP. Everyone copies everything. And if you look at the market, that's indeed the case. My game also contains a game mode based on Flappy Bird. And I'm sure I didn't invent quiz games either. But hear me out. Selling your IP means in simple words, and I'm by no means a lawyer, and also it depends of course on the contract and how it's written, you sell all your rights to distribute your product and also to use images associated with it. Why would you do that except for yeah, really a huge amount of money? Speaking of money, I of course downloaded some of their games beforehand to try out how they work and what pops up in your eyes immediately is ads everywhere. I use ads myself to generate revenue. It doesn't matter how much you love game dev, if you want to make a living out of that passion, you need some sort of sustainable income. But Jesus Christ, you watch more ads in those type of games than you actually play. Do you want to make games like these? Maybe you really need the money, but are you willing to take the risk to not reach that contract step? I'd say the only thing they had to offer to me was a chance to get loads of money. I can play Lotto as well. In numbers, 100k. What a huge amount that Adam just threw into the room. If something is too good to be true, it sometimes is. Adam even left the meeting for a while. Like, who on earth would leave a meeting where we're discussing a $100,000 deal? That's simply inappropriate. And basically, money was always the main argument. When I asked what happened with the games that are not listed on their website, they all make profit. You get a couple of thousand, you get the revenue share on top for sure and so on. I felt like Adam was no longer patient and on a rush to his next appointment with another game dev who dreams to see his or her game played by millions on the planet. And well, if a situation is too complex, and too urgent or intransparent and you're not given the time or information to overthink it, I rather believe in my gut feeling than in a head decision under pressure. Oh, and uh, yeah, never trust this area when it comes to decision making. Okay, we reached a point where my gut feeling told me, not today. 
Thank you, Adam. It was a pleasure to talk about a possible collaboration. I'll keep your contact information for future project if that's okay, but I don't see us coming together in this case. And that was the interview. Now the question goes out to you guys. Am I just too critical of such publishers and completely misjudged the whole thing and I will remain a poor ass part-time indie dev? Or do you think it was the right decision to not cooperate in this case? I'm curious to hear your opinion. Would you sell your IP? Let me know in the comments. In the time between the interview with the publisher and the point I'm making this video, I got contacted by two people. One of them is in a slightly different process as far as I know and is currently running those tests on his game. I wish him the best of luck and may he even get 100 millions from that collaboration. I wish you the best dude. The other guy who contacted me did collaborate with this specific publisher in the past and he warned me. The tests with his game didn't turn out to be profitable and the collaboration didn't proceed further. Only months later, he found a game pretty similar to his on social media made by the publisher's studio. Maybe it's a coincidence and of course the guy is just reporting from his perspective and I don't know him, but in any case everyone has to make up their own mind. The process until you sign a contract may vary and the contract itself varies too. To end this part of the video I can give you three really important advice. First, never make decisions under pressure. You are worth the time. Stand by your values and if it comes to a contract Get a lawyer, even if it's expensive. Get a lawyer and check what's there. And now, close to the end of the video, it's time for a new community spotlight. If you want to be featured with your game, devlog or whatever game related content you make, sub to the channel and just become part of the Discord community, share your game in community spotlight and you're good to go. And today, here's Save the Sun by Barrow Games. This game is a pixel art space puzzle platformer where you use gravity and magnetism to solve puzzles and hopefully, in the end, find a shiny little piece of the sun that got stolen by some nasty aliens. You'll need your brain cells because although the levels start easy, they get more and more challenging after a while. The game is made in Unity and it's available for Android on the Google Play Store. So I recommend you support Barrow Games and give Save the Sun a try. Okay, that was it. I hope this video was interesting to watch. If you like what you saw, consider giving a thumb up and subscribing, which helps to grow the channel. From my side, I can only say have a great week everyone and see you next time in the next video. Cheers!